By early 1945, Allied forces had breached the formidable defenses of the Siegfried Line and were poised to strike deep into the heart of Germany. In an attempt to halt the advancing Allied forces toward its core territories, the Germans resorted to desperate measures. The 512th Heavy Panzerjäger Battalion was established at Dollarsheim, with the primary objective of impeding the Allied progress. Deployment arrangements were initiated on February 15, 1945. The battalion was equipped with the new Jagdtiger tank destroyer, manufactured at the Nibelungenwerk factory, located near the Austrian town of St. Valentin. The Jagdtiger was the heaviest armored fighting vehicle produced during the war, mounting a 128mm main gun inside a 79-ton chassis. Despite its imposing capabilities, production remained limited, with only about 80 units manufactured. These rare vehicles were exclusively assigned to two elite units, the 512th and the 653rd Heavy Panzerjäger Battalion. Company 1 of the 512th was under the command of Oberleutnant Albert Ernst, a distinguished panzer ace. Similarly, Company 2 was commanded by Oberleutnant Otto Carius, another renowned figure in armored warfare. Captain Albert Ernst was impressed by the colossal vehicle and its formidable 128mm gun, boasting a barrel length exceeding 8 meters. After conducting firing trials in the Dollarsheim region, the fresh tank destroyers were deployed in action against the American bridgehead across the Rhine at Remagen on March 10, 1945. For crews accustomed to conventional tanks, operating the Jagdtiger presented unique challenges and experiences. Prior to engaging in combat, the gun's travel lock and barrel support mechanisms needed to be disengaged. Aiming necessitated maneuvering the entire vehicle, as the 128mm main gun was situated within a fixed superstructure. On the other hand, Transitioning to the Jag Tiger presented minimal challenges for Ernst and other veterans with experience in tank destroyers. On March 10, the German assault on the Remagen bridgehead involving Jag Tigers ended in failure, primarily due to the fragmented deployment of attack forces. Despite Hitler's directive to engage immediately with every available unit, the attack, including Ernst's company, proved unsuccessful. In the aftermath of the failed assault, Ernst and his Jagdtigers were tasked with covering the German retreat. Positioned strategically, the tank destroyers effectively disabled pursuing American tanks from a distance of 2 kilometers, highlighting the exceptional accuracy of the 128mm main gun. Subsequently, Ernst and his unit withdrew through to the town of Ziegen, where a German counterattack was planned to open the Ruhr pocket. On April 1, 1945, American troops surrounded the Ruhr area at Lipstadt. To the north, British-Canadian forces advanced, while American units pushed deeper into the hinterland to the south. Within the Ruhr pocket, approximately 320,000 German soldiers from Army Group B and 4 million civilians were trapped. As the focus of the Western Front shifted towards northern and central Germany, American forces tightened their grip on the Ruhr pocket, narrowing it to just a few kilometers. On April 12, operations commenced to split the combat zone. Ernst and his battle group were tasked with covering the rear of the retreating army, serving as the rear guard. Reinforced with an assault gun platoon, several Panzer IVs, and an anti-aircraft platoon, the battle group possessed significant firepower. Led by Ernst, who provided experienced leadership, the unit included members from his previous unit. Upon arriving in Altina on April 8, Ernst received orders to move to Iserlohn by train. While some elements traveled by rail to Minden, several assault guns and tanks headed to Iserlohn. 
Ernst led his Yag Tigers through the heavily bombed town of Hagen, navigating through rubble-filled streets. In the early hours of the next morning, Captain Ernst received reports of approaching American tanks. Determined to assess the situation firsthand, he climbed a steep hill to observe a long column of American vehicles moving towards them along Federal Highway 1. Ordering his troops into position, Ernst instructed them to hold fire until his command. With the American forces advancing towards the heart of the Ruhr pocket, Ernst saw disarmed German soldiers marching back into captivity, further underscoring the dire situation. As the American combat command approached, Ernst gave the decisive order to open fire. German armored vehicles unleashed a devastating barrage, causing chaos among the American ranks. Despite American attempts to retaliate, the Germans' well-chosen position shielded them from harm. The relentless German fire halted the American advance, forcing their vehicles to veer off the road into vulnerable positions. While the battle seemed futile by this point, the Germans fought fiercely, targeting enemy vehicles with precision. Although the Americans attempted to respond, their efforts fell short as German defenses remained impervious. Despite the inevitable outcome, the German forces held their ground during this initial attack, delivering a significant blow to the advancing American forces. Although his men were excited, Ernst understood the fighting style of Americans well and anticipated that they would deploy their air force next. Be cautious when the fighter bombers arrive. Take cover under your vehicle, Ernst cautioned them. As the aircraft alert sounded, the anti-aircraft guns prepared for action. They engaged the incoming fighter bombers, bringing down few American planes. However, a well-aimed bomb destroyed one of the guns, killing its entire crew. With their ammunition depleted and facing continuous air attacks, Ernst knew they had to retreat. He ordered a gradual withdrawal, with himself and a few others forming the rear guard. As the battle group withdrew, Ernst observed the roads for enemy pursuit. Despite inflicting significant losses on the American forces, the German breakthrough attempt was called off due to overwhelming enemy strength. The following day, Ernst received orders to hold the Dalinghofen airfield. As he set up command in Hemer, he witnessed the retreat of the civilian leadership, leaving the soldiers to face the approaching Americans. As the Americans advanced, the Yag Tigers engaged and destroyed some of their tanks. Ernst discussed the situation with the mayor of Hemer, emphasizing his willingness to follow orders, but deferring ultimate decision-making to higher-ranking authorities. On April 13, Captain Ernst faced escalating tension, as reports indicated the imminent threat of American advance. With Minden falling nearby, Ernst realized the gravity of the situation. When approached by a medical captain urging a ceasefire to protect the wounded, Ernst took the initiative, sending a medical officer as an emissary to negotiate with the Americans under a white flag. Despite difficulties in locating unit headquarters and hesitation among officers, Ernst pressed for negotiations, ultimately gaining agreement from most officers to participate if he led the discussions. The Americans accepted the proposed ceasefire, allowing battlegroup Ernst to maintain their positions. During negotiations led by American Major Boyd McCune, a concerning report arrived detailing deteriorating conditions in Hemer, including the release of Russian prisoners who were causing unrest. In response, McCune advocated for a harsh approach, ordering the shooting of armed civilians to restore order. To contain the situation, American tanks were deployed to encircle the POW camp, where the Russian prisoners had broken out. Despite their desire for freedom, the tanks intervened to prevent further chaos, forcibly returning the prisoners to the camp. On the night of April 14th to 15th, there was relative calm. However, on April 15th, American tanks began advancing towards Iserlohn. 
Despite strong resistance from battle group Ernst, which aimed to avoid the city's destruction and protect its large refugee population, the situation became increasingly dire. Captain Ernst, determined to prevent unnecessary civilian casualties, confronted General Books, who was in command of the town, urging him to witness the reality on the ground. However, the general's response was dismissive, leading to Ernst's confinement during a crucial conference. Fearing for his life, Ernst staged a daring escape, commandeering an armored car and returning to his unit with vital information. Despite the chaos, he assumed command of Ezerlone, seeking out General Books, who had disappeared by then. With the support of his men and his English-speaking abilities, Ernst took charge and vowed to hold out until further orders. The situation in Ezerlone became increasingly dire, with American fire intensifying. Despite attempts to communicate with other stations, there was no response. Eventually, a message from an unidentified headquarters emphasized the city's defense at all costs, a directive Ernst disregarded. Recognizing the gravity of the situation, Ernst gathered his men and conveyed his decision to surrender Ezerlone to the Americans, prioritizing the safety of the city's nearly 300,000 civilians. He proposed personally negotiating the surrender, symbolized by a white flag on their armored car. Ernst also granted his men the option to take him prisoner and assume command themselves. In a show of solidarity, the officers voiced their support for Ernst's leadership, with First Lieutenant Rondorf expressing unwavering confidence in him. Grateful for their trust, Ernst prepared to face the impending surrender with resolve. In the early hours of April 16th, two soldiers from Battle Group Ernst were tragically killed by artillery fire, marking the last casualties under Ernst's command in World War II. As the sun rose, Ernst drove towards Lake Siler, where he encountered American forces. Seeking to negotiate a surrender, he was initially met with resistance, but eventually gained an audience with the American colonel. After a brief exchange, a ceasefire was agreed upon, allowing for the treatment of wounded soldiers on both sides. Determined to prevent further bloodshed, Ernst decided to surrender Ezerlone himself. He coordinated with his units, including communicating with Lieutenant Rondorf, who was already in the city, and making necessary arrangements for the surrender. Upon arriving at the city hall, Ernst was accompanied by Yag Tiger destroyers. Inside, he found a small group including local officials and a clergyman. With this assembly, Ernst began the process of surrendering Ezerlone to the American forces, effectively ending the city's involvement in the war. Ernst then encountered a police major, who had removed his decorations and rank insignia. Disgusted, Ernst left him standing and proceeded to negotiate with Lt. Col. Kriz of the 99th Division. Successfully addressing key points, they arranged for the surrender to occur at Schiller Plaza in the presence of Ernst's entire battle group. Leaving the city hall, Ernst felt a mix of relief and sadness, knowing he had prevented immense suffering. However, his moment of triumph was tarnished when a civilian insulted him, prompting Ernst to suppress his emotions. As the surrender unfolded, civilians flooded the square, and Ernst's men, accompanied by their Yag Tiger tank destroyers, stood ready. Addressing the American commander, Ernst emphasized the honorable surrender of Ezerlone's last defenders in the face of inevitable defeat, appealing for fair treatment for his men. Ernst demonstrated unwavering loyalty to his men during the surrender. When offered personal freedom by the American commander, he refused unless his soldiers were granted the same. Despite further offers, including from General Lauer, Ernst chose to remain with his men, walking into captivity alongside them. Ultimately, Ezerlone's surrender marked the end of the war in the Ruhr Pocket. <laughs>